Since 1948, the Middle East has been plagued by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and while 2020 has brought a new two-state proposal from America and new diplomatic relations between Israel and other Arab states, any long-term solution still seems like a pipe dream. But what if the conflict never came to be? What if we lived in a timeline without Israel? Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian. In this video, we'll ask the question, what if Israel lost the Arab-Israeli War of 1948? And yeah, this isn't the sort of video that'll net me a lot of friends on the internet, but I will do my best to present a well-researched and unbiased alternate history. With that said, time for historical context! Now, I can make a whole video on the complicated history of this war, but for the sake of getting to the alternate history as quickly as possible, I will be brief. If you need more details, I recommend checking out the videos done by the Cold War and the Kings and Generals channels, which I will link to in the upper right corner. Anywho. The region known as Palestine was administered by Britain after the end of World War I. Because of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, in which the British government announced their support for establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine, hundreds of thousands of Jews moved to Palestine from the 1920s to the 1940s. As you can imagine, the new immigrants who bought land and evicted the Arabs living on it angered local Palestinians. Violence between the two groups broke out, and while Britain attempted to rein in Jewish immigration, the Holocaust made a Jewish state an imperative for many Jews seeking to protect themselves from another genocide. Ultimately, Britain punted the issue to the new United Nations, who came up with the bright idea of partitioning Palestine between an Arab and Jewish state in 1947. Although Jewish representatives were supportive of the plan, it was rejected by the Arab states, which thought that the UN plan was too favorable to the Jews. For example, it gave 55% of Palestine to the Jewish state, despite Jews only making up a third of the population of Palestine at the time. Meanwhile, the proposal led to civil war in Palestine, where the more organized Jewish forces overwhelmed the Arab Palestinians. So when Jewish settlers declared independence as the state of Israel on May 14, 1948, and the British finally left Palestine on May 15th, a coalition of Arab states, including Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Transjordan, Saudi Arabia, under the guidance of the Arab League, invaded Palestine, starting to Arab-Israeli War of 1948, also known as Israel's War of Independence and the Nakba, or the Catastrophe, by the Palestinians. The Arab League expected an easy victory and were unprepared for the resistance Israel gave them. It also didn't help that their armies were poorly equipped and didn't have the manpower to overwhelm the new Israel Defense Force, or IDF, especially after it received weapons from Czechoslovakia during a truce period in June and July of 1948. This was done under the encouragement of the Soviet Union, who pragmatically thought the existence of Israel would drive the Arab nations into the Soviet camp. So while the Arabs did advance to Palestine far enough to threaten both Tel Aviv and West Jerusalem, the Israelis were able to drive them off and occupy all of Palestine, minus the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. Traditional accounts of the war paint the picture of the Israelis being a ragtag group of freedom fighters, outnumbered and outgunned by the Arab juggernaut that refused any offers of peace. More recent histories that pull from declassified documents regarding the war portray a more nuanced account, where the IDF, which included veterans of World War II, outnumbered the Arab armies by the end of the war. Meanwhile, rather than being a united front, the Arabs were actually divided on what the end goal of the war should be. Additionally, Israel is also given some of the blame for diplomacy breaking down with the Arab states. Perhaps one of the more controversial takes from these new histories is what caused the Palestinian refugee crisis. Traditional accounts say the Palestinians just left of their own free will, per the suggestion of their leaders. While that is true in some cases, historians now point to accounts of Israelis expelling Palestinians from their homes, with some Israelis even massacring civilians and what has been called ethnic cleansing. And yes, there were massacres carried out by the Arab side. I'm not denying that. To be honest, neither side comes out clean in this war, but then again, whoever comes out clean in any war. Anywho, now we need to derail history and get Israel to lose the war. But how? Well, my research suggests that the arms shipments from Czechoslovakia were extremely important for Israel's victory. As Yitzhak Rabin, an IDF commander in the war and later Israel's fifth prime minister, stated, without the arms from Czechoslovakia, it is very doubtful whether we would have been able to conduct the war. Thus, without these weapons, the IDF wouldn't be able to arm enough soldiers to counter the Arabs. So maybe the United States, which enforced an arms embargo on all combatants, takes it more seriously and keeps the guns from reaching Israel. Or maybe Britain, who clashed in the air with the Israelis later in the war, found a reason to become more pro-Arab and intervene to stop the arms from arriving. Or maybe the Soviets get second thoughts and tell Czechoslovakia to stay out of it. Either way, the IDF can't equip enough soldiers to go on the offensive and are ultimately driven out of Jerusalem and barely manage to hold on to Tel Aviv. That being said, I don't see the Arab League being able to capitalize fully on this turn of events. 
As I mentioned earlier, their forces were under-equipped and motivation to win varied. For example, the Arab Legion, the military of Transjordan, or Jordan as it is known today, was under orders to only occupy lands set aside to the Arab Palestinians in the UN Partition Plan, for reasons that will become apparent later in the video. Other Arab states, like Lebanon and Iraq, only made token attempts to invade Palestine and mostly just occupied a few villages. So unless the Arab League gets help from alien space bats, they aren't going to conquer all of Palestine without paying a huge cost in men and materials that they frankly couldn't afford. For another example, we need to talk about a big assumption people have about alternate histories where Israel loses its war of independence. You see, when I asked people on Twitter what their thoughts were on this what if, a lot of people thought that the ultimate outcome of an Arab victory would be genocide. And yeah, I just don't see that as plausible. Sure, there was fear among Jewish settlers that they would not be safe in an Arab-controlled Palestine, and Arab rhetoric before and during the war didn't help ease their fears. Leaders of Iraq and Egypt warned the international community that the lives of Jews around the Middle East would be in danger if Palestine was partitioned. Meanwhile, Abdul Rahman Hassan Azam, the first Secretary General of the Arab League, allegedly said the establishment of a Jewish state would lead to a war of extermination and a momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Mongolian Massacre and the Crusaders. Which seems pretty damning until you realize that no one knows for certain when or where Azam said this. David Horowitz, who would later become the governor of the Bank of Israel, actually quotes Azam as saying, We shall try to defeat you. I'm not sure we'll succeed, but we'll try. We were able to drive out the Crusaders, but on the other hand, we lost Spain and Persia. It may be that we will lose Palestine, but it's too late to talk of peaceful solutions. Meanwhile, David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, called Azam the most honest and humane among Arab leaders, one of the few Arabs in the world who has a humane outlook and ideals which doesn't seem like something you would call the person you think would start a second holocaust. Furthermore, despite the threats made by some Arab states, the official stance of the Arab League wasn't to exterminate the Jews, but to prevent Palestine from being partitioned. As Azam told a Palestinian newspaper, whatever the outcome, the Arabs will stick to their offer of equal citizenship for Jews in Arab Palestine, and let them be as Jewish as they like. Granted, it's easy to say that now with the benefit of hindsight, but for a new nation that included survivors of the Holocaust, I can see why the fears of another genocide felt very real. That all said, guilt over the Holocaust was a real thing throughout Europe and America at the time. So if it felt like the Arabs were on the verge of a total victory, I could see intervention by America and its allies to prevent things from getting out of hand. Thus, with fear that Israel wasn't going to make it, and with the Arabs looking for an easy way out while still being able to declare victory, I think the stage is set for a very different end to the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. So, the war is over. Fears of genocide are receding, and now everyone has to figure out just what the hell to do about Palestine. And unfortunately, if you're a Palestinian nationalist, things aren't looking good. Officially, the Arab League went to war to preserve Palestine. But in reality, everyone wanted as much of Palestine as they could. For example, Transjordan secretly opposed an independent Palestine and planned to annex as much of the Arab area as they could, especially if it could net them a port on the Mediterranean Sea. Meanwhile, King Farouk of Egypt had plans to annex southern Palestine should the Arabs defeat the Israelis. Syria and Lebanon also desired Palestinian territory. Thus, in this alternate timeline, with the Arab League members wanting to divide Palestine, and coupled with the fact that Palestinians themselves would have little influence in the peace negotiations due to them needing to be bailed out by the Arab League, any Palestinian nationalist dream of an independent state would die rather quickly. Which honestly could cause some problems down the road, but we'll get to that point. In the meantime, who exactly is going to untie the Gordian knot of Palestine? Enter King Abdullah I of Transjordan. If there is anyone I could think of who could push through a piece that would satisfy, um, make everyone equally unhappy, that'd be him. In our timeline, Abdullah and his family, the Hashemites, revolted against the Ottoman Empire during World War I in the Great Arab Revolt. After the revolt, Abdullah, perhaps sensing where the winds were blowing, established himself as the ruler of the Emirate of Transjordan and put his country under the protection of the British. During this time, Abdullah maintained good relations not only with the British, but with the Jews who were settling in neighboring Palestine. This made Abdullah the person that some trusted with the future of post-British Palestine. For example, as discussed in Eli Podé's book, Chances for Peace, Missed Opportunities in the Arab-Israeli Conflict, the British supported Transjordan annexing the Arab parts of Palestine as early as 1937 with the Peel Commission's proposed partition of Palestine. While this proposal obviously found support in Transjordan, it also found initial support in Syria, among the Maronite Christians in Lebanon, and even with some Palestinians. 
Meanwhile, in the lead-up to the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, Abdullah was in contact with Jewish authorities. In 1947, he proposed to Golda Meir, the fourth Prime Minister of Israel on our timeline, a union between his nation and Palestine, where a Jewish homeland would exist within its boundaries. Abdullah would be the head of this country, but the government, military, and economy of such a state would be jointly shared by the Arabs and Jews. More importantly, he stressed that he alone could protect the Jews from any Arab extremists. During the war itself, a similar proposal was made by UN mediator Folk Bernadotte, who suggested a union between Jordan and Israel. This new state would have the West Bank and some or all of the Negev included on the Arab side, while some or all of Western Galilee would be with Israel. Meanwhile, the whole of Jerusalem would be part of the Arab state, with the majority Jewish neighborhoods enjoying autonomy over local affairs. Thus, in my alternate timeline, a peace is reached where Transjordan and Palestine, along with the Israeli-occupied areas, form a union that I'm calling the Kingdom of Jordan and Palestine, which could look something like this map I had commissioned by the always talented Sean McKnight. Abdullah would lead this new state, while Israel becomes the Jewish Autonomous Zone, or JAZ, which controls part of the coast and northern Palestine, but cedes Jerusalem to the majority Arab government. The Jews would control all of their domestic affairs within the GAAZ and would be allowed a small security force for protection, a Jewish legion if you will. I think Britain and the UN would support the proposal which would bring most of the rest of the world on board. A desperate Israel might also accept the Union as a way of creating a Jewish homeland until the time for independent state was right. The Palestinians would be a harder sell, but they could be won over by Abdullah, guaranteeing that they would have a say in the new kingdom. Additionally, the 700,000 plus refugees would have a chance to return home, or at the very least could resettle in the Arab areas of the new kingdom. In fact, something similar to this happened in our timeline. In December 1948, Palestinian and Jordanian representatives met at the Jericho Conference, where they agreed that Jordan would annex the West Bank and Abdullah would be recognized as the King of Palestine. Then there is the Arab League. As I mentioned before, there was disunity among them, and many didn't trust Abdullah and suspected that he wanted to create an empire in the Middle East. So they may not like the idea of Abdullah getting Palestine, but with the rest of the world backing the proposal and the mounting costs of keeping their armies in the field, they might ultimately accept it so they could claim victory with the people back home. Perhaps Abdullah could even win over reluctant allies by exchanging territory, like giving Egypt some of the Negev. So, the war is over. The armies have returned home, and Abdullah is left to govern his new kingdom. So what happens next? Well, it would be naive to think that this divergence could secure a lasting peace in the Middle East. For example, in our timeline, the results of the Jericho Conference were not accepted by all Palestinians or other Arab states. And we can't forget that Abdullah himself was assassinated in 1951 by a Palestinian who feared he was about to recognize Israel. So even if Abdullah did his best to win over the Palestinians, I could still see some Palestinian nationalists actively working to secede from the kingdom with the help of other Arab states who might host a Palestinian government in exile. Meanwhile, more militant factions may carry out attacks on the government of Jordan and Palestine, and on the Jews in the JAZ. In fact, if these Palestinian nationalists gain enough support, we could see a civil war break out, as it did in our timelines Jordan in 1970 and 1971 in an event known as Black September, where the Jordan army fought against Palestinian rebels operating within their territory. Then of course there is the Jewish Autonomous Zone. The chances of them just meekly accepting autonomy within an Arab state aren't exactly high. Zionist paramilitary groups might continue to operate within the borders of the JAZ and resort to terrorist tactics in their quest for independence. If things really go downhill, we could see another Israeli war of independence, which would just delay the start of the conflict our timeline has been dealing with. Okay, so bloody chaos is still possible for the Kingdom of Jordan and Palestine, but is there a chance this new nation could make it work? Well, the need for a place to resettle the thousands of Jews displaced by World War II and the Holocaust might keep relations between the JAZ and the Kingdom of Jordan and Palestine stable, at least in the short term. Plus, the Kingdom would benefit economically from the Holy Land tourism, while the JAZ would attract both foreign capital and skilled immigrants. In our timeline, Israel was able to raise millions during its War of Independence, while many of the immigrants who came after the war were from the cities and towns of Europe, and often had to be trained on how to farm. Granted, the JAZ might receive less immigration because Israel isn't independent in this timeline, but then again, the threat of constant war with their Arab neighbors hasn't stopped immigration to Israel in our timeline, so who knows. One group who might not immigrate to the JAZ are Jews from other parts of the Middle East. In our timeline, many Jews living in Arab countries either left of their own free will or were expelled after Israel became independent. 
In this alternate timeline, where Israel is now the JAZ, the likelihood of Jews from those nations being expelled is lessened as their home countries may not direct that much hostility toward them in a world where Israel was defeated. Speaking of their home countries, it goes without saying that a timeline without Israel would have a major impact on the political history of the Middle East. For example, the Egyptian monarchy might last longer, as Egypt's defeat in the 1948 war was one of the factors that led to its collapse. This would mean that Nasser would never come to power, and Egypt could have developed into a constitutional monarchy. Although a Suez Canal crisis could still happen, as I can't imagine a timeline without Egypt wanting that for themselves, but it would play out very differently without Israel to instigate the conflict for Britain. Meanwhile, the Lebanese Civil War, which lasted from 1975 to 1990, may not happen as the arrival of thousands of Palestinian refugees that upset the demographic balance of that country would be avoided. Additionally, the March 1949 Syrian coup d'etat could be avoided, which would help the fledgling Syrian democracy, or lead to a situation where Abdullah was offered the crown of Syria, which is something he did covet in our timeline. And if Iraq keeps their Hashemite monarchy, we might finally see a Hashemite-led Arab federation that Abdullah and his family went to war against the Ottomans for. Relations between the United States and the Arab states could also be better in this timeline. Without Israel, more American aid could go to Arab nations, which would weaken the influence of the Soviet Union, although one might drive some pro-independence Israelis over to the USSR. Nevertheless, better relations could mean that events like the 1973 oil embargo would not happen since it was targeted at nations that supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War. So a more pro-American Middle East sounds plausible if you believe that Israel has an overwhelmingly negative effect on American and Middle Eastern relations. As Joseph Jaffe points out in his 2009 foreign policy article regarding a timeline without Israel, Israel is often the boogeyman in Middle East politics, and a politician being against them is an easy way to rile up the people and distract them from their problems at home, like a lack of civil rights, high unemployment, poor education, and few opportunities for women. Sort of like how certain American politicians blame everything on immigrants. And while I don't agree with everything that was said in that article, we can't ignore that a lot of conflicts that plague the Middle East, like the Iran-Iraq war or the current conflict in Yemen, have anything to do with Israel, and thus its absence as an independent state would not prevent wars in the region. Even the non-existence of Israel wouldn't guarantee better relations between the United States and the Middle East. American policy in the region could still create a lot of enemies. For example, Israel had nothing to do with America overthrowing the government of Iran in 1953. Instead, America's the oil must flow policy was probably what did it. <laughs> and then there is the question of Islamic terrorism. Admittedly, the lack of a Jewish state would have denied radical Islamists with a source of propaganda, but if America still acts like it does in this timeline, it could still drive new recruits into their arms. So yeah, this is a hard what if to answer with any kind of certainty. While I stand by what I think the short term consequences would be, the long term consequences are anyone's guess. It's hard to do this topic justice without a lot more research, and even then, I'm sure I could find crowds of people willing to tell me everything I said was wrong. Nevertheless, I hope this video challenged some assumptions that people had, like the belief that an Arab victory would lead to genocide, or that the non-existence of Israel would solve all the Middle East problems. And who knows? Perhaps my best case scenario isn't that implausible after all. And there is a timeline out there where a Jewish autonomous zone did eventually gain independence as Israel. But it was one not through war, but by diplomacy, where Jews and Muslims together celebrated the arrival of a new member of the international community. I like to imagine such a timeline is out there, and perhaps it has something to teach us about our potential future. Well, that's all I have to say on the subject. If you enjoy what I do, please like, comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Bye.